So thank you. It's a pleasure to be talking here today. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk about the renormalized volume of quasi and manifolds and especially the connection between the renormalized volume and the volume of the convex core. And data, you know, connected to the renormalized volume that live at infinity of quasi and manifolds. Connect, and the way they are connected to data that live on the boundary of the convex core. And the reason I'm talking about this is that I think there are a number of questions that are still, you know, to be answered in this area. So I should, you know, start by recalling some very basic things. I'm going to talk about quasi friction manifolds. So uh, the definition is there, a quasi friction manifold. You know, it's a manifold which is a hyperbolic, a complete hyperbolic manifold, which is homeomorphic to a surface cross R, where S is a closed oriented surface of genus at least two. And we want this manifold to contain a compact, convex, and non-empty subset. And this means uh, we are looking at something that looks like this. It's a you know, manifold that you know, has this structure of a product. And um, you know, it goes to infinity on both sides. And it contains this compact, convex, non-empty subset. And here, you know, again, we have this surface. I mean, it's a basically simple, simplified picture, but that's the idea. So when we are in this situation, there is a number of things that we know. So one is that because it's a complete hyperbolic manifold, it is a quotient of hyperbolic free space by a group acting by isometries. And uh, another thing is that, I mean, this is more you know, connected to the, to the, um, to the quasi function situation. So we can define the limit set of the action. And this limit set is defined by taking any point in, the, in hyperbolic free space taking the orbit of this point under the action of the group and looking at the intersection of the closure of this orbit with the boundary at infinity. And if we start with, from a quasi friction manifold, we get something which is a you know, Jordan curve. It's actually better than this, but let's say it's a Jordan curve uh, in the boundary at infinity of H3, which is CP1. And uh, we have a properly discontinuous action of the final group of, of S, of you know, this uh, group, on hyperbolic free space, but also on the boundary at infinity of hyperbolic free space outside this Jordan curve. So in other terms, you know, you, we have this boundary of the manifold, and the boundary of the manifold, of the quasi friction manifold here, is made of those two surfaces, S plus and S minus. And we'll find this here, the, this, this, you know, upper boundary, upper component of the complement of the Jordan curve is the universal cover of S plus, and the uh, boundary of the um, lower, the lower boundary will be uh, found on the lower side of the Jordan curve, right? So that's uh, all I will say, I guess, at this point on quasi friction manifold. Um, but uh, this leads to interesting structures on the boundary, the boundary S plus and S minus. And the reason is that because we have this action of the group, uh, of the phenomenal group of the manifold or of the surface on the boundary at infinity by isometries of hyperbolic free space. You know, isometries of hyperbolic free space act on the boundary by CP1, by, 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 by actions of PSL2C, so by Mobius transformations. Um, we're going to get at infinity a structure which is called a CP1 structure. So it's a structure which is locally modeled on CP1 with, you know, changes of charts which are given by Möbius, Möbius transformations, elements of PSL2C. So we get this pretty rich structure on, on the boundary at infinity. We get this CP1 structure sigma plus and sigma minus here. And uh, um, this is a bit too rich in a way. Uh, you know, basically the space of CP1 structures is a space of real dimension 12 G minus 12. And if you think of it, there are reasons to believe by you know, counting dimensions that the space of all quasi friction structures on this manifold also has dimension 12 G minus 12. So if you know the data sigma plus, you already know the whole manifold, right? In fact, there is also a sort of you know, another structure, which is a weaker structure on the boundary at infinity, which we're going to call C plus and C minus. And C plus and C minus contains a lot less information it's given by the complex structure underlying the CP1 structure sigma plus. So C plus and C minus are in the transform space of the surface, right? They are you know, complex structures. 
And uh, a key point in this you know, theory is the theorem of Bell's, the Bell's double uniformization theorem that tells you that if you know C plus and C minus, you can uniquely reconstruct the manifold or quasi fraction manifold M, right? That's you know, a very, 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 very basic situation of what physicists here call ADS-CFT correspondence. Right? I mean, you have some data at infinity. There is a unique way to fill this by you know, a, high, a complete hyperbolic metric. OK. Um, oh. oh, sorry. Oh, OK. Yeah. So this basically gives you the you know, starting point of the data at infinity. And we're going to see more data at infinity later. But we can also play a different game. And instead of looking at what happens at infinity, we're going, we are going to use this convex subset that we have here. And uh, you know, a basic remark is that if you take any convex, non-empty closed convex subsets of a quasi function manifold, for instance, the intersection will still be a convex subset. And for this reason, there is a smallest non-empty convex subset in M, which is going to be called C of M, its convex core. And this has very interesting properties, I think discovered by Thurston, I guess. Um, one, you know, one first basic remark is that you know, it is, except in very simple cases called function cases, when, when the, you know, this, you know, in, in those simple cases, the, the subspace, this convex subspace space is a totally geodesic surface, right? This can happen, but we're going to forget about this situation for the rest of the talk. And otherwise, uh, the boundary of C of M is the disjoint union of two surfaces, which are both copies, I mean, homeomorphic to S. So as for the boundary at infinity, we have two surfaces here and here. But now they are locally convex surfaces. And uh, they're locally convex surfaces of a very specific type. You know, if you think of it, they are, because they are, you know, boundaries of smallest convex subsets, they, they cannot have any extreme point. You know, they, can have, they cannot have any vertex, otherwise you could cut off the vertex and get something smaller, which would be a contradiction. So what you must have is something that is a locally a pleated surface, right? It's like, you know, something like a polyhedron. It has faces, it has vertices, uh, edges, sorry, but it has no vertex. Yeah? So if you think of the you know, simpler situation you can think of, what you'll have is a surface which is made of totally geodesic pieces that are glued along edges, right? And uh, the sort of you know, richness of this situation, discovered by Thurston, I guess, is that it could be a lot more interesting. And what can happen is that usually you have a banding which is along a measured lamination. So instead of having a banding along a finite number of edges, you could have a banding along a geodesic lamination. And along each leaf of this banding, you could have a very small banding. Um, Right, but the consequence of this is, you know, basically you can think of it in the case of polyhedra. If you think of a line where there is some bending, there will be no singularity of the induced metric. You know, that's something that happens already in, in Euclidean free space. If you glue two half planes along their common boundary, what you get is something which is isometric to a full plane. And this is going to be true in hyperbolic free space too. If you glue two hyperbolic planes, half planes into their common boundaries, there will be no singularity of the induced metric. And the same happens for those, you know, metrics. They will, the induced metrics on those surfaces will have no singularity along the bending lamination. They will be hyperbolic metrics. So you find immediately that on the boundary of the convex core, you have a rich, you know, geometric situation, rich geometric data. You have two hyperbolic metrics and you have two measured laminations. Yeah. So I didn't tell you exactly what a measured lamination is, and I'm not going to tell you exactly. But what I should say is that you can define a space of measured laminations by taking the space of you know, weighted multicurves on the surface. So in other terms, you, know, you take a surface. You know, a weighted multicurve is going to be a disjoint union of simple closed curves with a weight for each of them. And then you're going to say that two weighted multicurves are, are closed. Are closed. Sorry, they are closed if if they are intersection with any closed curve on the surface is almost the same. So this gives you a topology on the space of multicurves, weighted multicurves on the surface, and taking the uh, completion 
of the space of weighted multi curves with respect to this topology gives you the space of measured, la measured laminations. Okay. Um, now, another thing that I need to understand this is the notion of length. So obviously, if you have a weighted multi-curve, you can define its length for any reference hyperbolic metric, right? You take the, you know, you realize every curve as a geodesic, take the length of this curve and multiply it by the weight. And the sum of those, you know, weighted lengths is the length of the weighted multi-curve. And now a theorem of Thurston is that the length function that you have just defined extends by continuity to a length function defined on measured laminations. Yeah? Okay, so this is the background, and I can tell you more about open <coughs> questions. Um, okay, there are you know, two things that we, I'd like to know, you know, things that were conjectured by Thurston and that we don't know how to prove at the moment. Um, you know, again, you know, if we come back to this picture here, on the boundary of the convex core, we have this hyperbolic metric M plus, M minus is here, and we have the upper banding lamination and the lower banding lamination, L plus and L minus. So first question, is it true that exactly like in the situation of the Bell's double uniformization, any two hyperbolic metrics can be uniquely realized on the boundary of the convex core? Yeah? So if you think of this in terms of the data at infinity of C plus instead of M plus, this is exactly the statement of the Bell's you know, double uniformization theorem. But in this case, this is not completely known. Actually, it's known that the existence holds, and this is a consequence of uh, work of Epstein and Marden and also work of Laboury in the early 90s. But uniqueness is not known. And uh, uniqueness is not known basically because the local rigidity statement is not known. And there is another conjecture of Austin, which is that if you choose any reasonable couple of L minus and L plus, meaning you know, any two laminations that satisfy some natural conditions. So one is that they must fill. So you know, if you take any closed curve on the surface, it must intersect either of them, basically. And moreover, it's clear that any closed curve you know, in those laminations must have weight at most pi. I mean, less than pi, actually. The, otherwise, this cannot work. And those are natural conditions. And the conjecture that Thurston made is that if you take any two laminations, measured laminations, satisfying those conditions, then you can realize them uniquely as the measured banding lamination on the boundary of the convex core of some quasi and manifold. And again, you know, this is not known. So it's true, I mean, it's a uh, theorem of Bonan and Otal that it's true if you take two measured banding laminations that are of the you know, simplest possible uh, type, meaning they are, you know, long closed curves. They're basically weighted multi-curves in the sense I talked about here. So in this, it, in this case, Bonan and Otal proved that the, you know, the conjecture is true. You, there is a unique, you can realize them uniquely as the you know, measured banding lamination on the boundary of a quasi fraction manifold. And in general, they proved that existence holds, but they, they couldn't prove uniqueness. And it's exactly the same sort of situation as in this, in this conjecture for the, measured, uh, for the induced metric on the boundary. And what's funny is that you know, in this case, you also, what is lacking is this you know, local rigidity statement and what Bonahon proved um, is that the rigidity statement for the, measured, for the measured lamination and for the induced metric, they are actually, actually equivalent. So if you can prove one, you can prove the other one. But we don't know how to prove either. So that's an you know, interesting situation where some you know, very basic statement is still unknown. And uh, now um, I'd like to say a little more about the way those things are connected. Right, the measured lamination, the, banding, the measured banding lamination, and the idiose metric. So the way they're connected is by the Schleifli formula. I'm going to you know, go through a little bit of you know, polyhedral geometry and then come back to convex cores. So what is the Schleifli formula? You know, you, you, it's a, you know, very, this is all mathematics from the 19th century. Now, instead of taking some you know, complicated thing like a quasi fraction manifold, I'm going to take a simple object like a polyhedron in hyperbolic free space. So I take this polyhedron, and I take a first order deformation of this polyhedron. I call it P dot. So P is the polyhedron. P dot is the first order deformation. And I suppose that you know, P dot doesn't change the combinatorics of P. So I'm just moving the vertices you know, in such a way that the combinatorics doesn't change. And Schleffli, in 1850, I guess, 
discovered that there is a beautiful formula relating the volume of P, V is the volume of P, and actually the variation of the volume and the variation of the angles, the interior angles, the hydral angles of the polyhedron. So the formula is exactly the following. So twice the variation of V is the sum over the edges of the length of the edge times the variation of the interior angle, or if you want to state it in a way that's going to be closer to what we do, uh, twice the variation is equal to the sum of the length times the variation of the exterior angles, which are pi minus the interior angles. Yeah? Um, there is a nicer way to look at this simple formula. So the nicer way is, you know, you can define this dual volume of this polyhedron. And I'm just going to state it, you know, to define it as the dual volume being the volume minus the sum, half the sum of the length times the, the exterior angles. And then you, you know, clearly from this theorem, it's obvious that you have this formula, that twice the variation of the dual volume is minus the sum of the variation of the length times the angles. Yeah? Yes? Vincent, you have a doubt about Excuse me? That they have? Um, uh, I don't know. Did I get something wrong in the formula? No? Okay. Well, well anyway. <laughs> I hope this is correct. I, I could be wrong in the coefficients, but I hope this is correct. Okay, so what is the connection to what we do? You know, basically those, those polyhedra, again, they look like convex cores in some sense. And uh, actually, there is a Schleffli formula for convex cores of quasi function manifold. And it's called the, the Bonaron Schleffli formula. And uh, Bonaron uh, proved this, you know, uh, by the, I mean, first, you know, worked a lot to understand what the formula means, and then he proved the formula. So now we look at the volume of the convex core of M, and we call this VC of M. And we want to understand how this is going to vary in a deformation of a quasi flexion manifold. So the bonaron schleffli formula tells you the following. It's exactly the same as the, you know, Schleffli formula that we saw before, except that you have to understand what we're talking about. But it tells you that if you take a variation of the a deformation of the quasi flexion manifold, twice the variation of the volume of the convex core is going to, length, to be the length of the, the length for the induced metric on the boundary of the convex core of the variation of the, of the banding measured lamination. Yeah? So this plays the role you know, of the angles, of the exterior angles. And basically, from the variation of the pleating angles, you make up something, which is what Wenham calls the whole deco cycle. And he proved that you can make sense of the meaning, you can make sense of the length of a whole deco cycle. And when you actually make it make sense of this, you actually get twice the variation of the volume of the convex core. Yeah. So um, now uh, there is, you know, there is a notion of dual volume of dual volume also for you know quasi function manifold. It's the volume minus one half the length of the measured banding lamination, exactly as in a previous situation, right? Here, you know, we had the sum of the length time exterior angle, and here, exactly, uh, you have to. Closer to this machine. Sorry. Okay. I guess the batteries are off. What am I doing? Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. So you have to. So this is exactly the same formula. You know, in terms of the of the of the dual volume. I mean, the dual volume is the volume minus one half the sum of the, you know, length time the time time bending angle of the of the uh, bending curve, you know, but in this measured lamination situation, and then you have a dual bonaron schleffli formula, which we're going to refer to in, in the future. Maybe I'm going to write it again, which is that the variation of the dual volume of the convex core is equal to minus the variation of the length of the lamination L on the variation of the metric M dot, right? So if you think of this, this is a much simpler formula, right? You just take the length of the measured lamination L as a function over the space, and it happens to be a smooth function. I think Steve proved this, right? 
the analytic function. And uh, so it is a smooth function. You can take its differential, and you evaluate the differential on the variation of the induced metric, which is a you know, tangent vector to Teichmann space, so the Teichmann space of the boundary of M. And uh, okay, and this is a dual bonnard schleffli formula, basically. It's, you can see it as a consequence of this, this bonnard schleffli formula, but it's also much simpler, and actually, uh, you know, you don't need this theory of Holdorf cycle to make sense of it. Okay, now I'm going to jump to infinity and talk about renormalized volume. And we're going to see later what the connection to what we said on the boundary of the convex core is. And, uh, you know, the connection is very close if we think of those things. So the renormalized volume of quasi function manifold is, you know, something that has two different origins. You can look at it in, in, in terms of, you know, hyperbolic metrics. And then in this setting, if you think of it in terms of Riemannian metric, you can extend it. And it, it was actually, you know, defined first, I guess, for things that are called Poincaré-Einstein metrics which are Einstein metrics in higher dimension that behave at infinity, basically like the Poincaré model, right? That's a very simple way of doing this, of, of, of explaining this. But basically in this setting, you can define a notion of renormalized volume. And this, is what, this was done you know, first by physicists like Hennington, Skanderis. And then it was you know, translated into mathematically understandable things by Witten. And then there were work of Graham and Witten about this. So that's the first way to look at this. You, know, you think of Riemannian metrics. And then there is another way to look at it in terms of complex analysis. And in that setting, what you do is you define what is called the Uville functional for you know, representations. And this was done by Tartagen and Zograph. So there are two completely different ways to look at this object. And if you look at the intersection, somehow you find a you know, renormalized volume of hyperbolic three-dimensional manifolds. Um, so I'm going to give you a definition that we you know, We've, we, we worked on with uh, Kirill Krasnov, who is a physicist, Nottingham now. And the definition is fairly simple, but you have to follow the details. <laughs> and basically, the idea is the following. So you take this you know, subset N of our manifold M. Maybe I'm going to do another drawing so that we follow more easily what's, going, what's happening, right? So you take this quasi function manifold M. It's always the same. And in M, I'm going to take some convex subset N. And it doesn't really have to be, it, it, it should not be the convex core. I mean, you know, that's a sort of confusion that some people make. You really should think, forget about the convex core in this situation. Uh, now you define this, you know, you, you choose this convex subset, and then you can define a sort of volume, you know, which is uh, simply the volume of N minus some boundary term. So there are reasons to think that this is the right boundary term, but anyway, just take this as a definition. And then basically what you do is you take the surfaces equidistant from N, and yeah? Oh yeah, it's the mean curvature of the boundary. Actually, uh, yeah, it, it actually should be twice the mean curvature of the boundary depending on the definition. So H is the trace of B, which is a shape operator of the surface, right? It's a sum of the principal curvatures. Yeah. Um, OK, so now you, you take this, you know, you take this, this, this subset N, and you take the surfaces which are equidistant to, a, to N, and you call them SR, right? R being the distance to N. And you look at the induced metric 1R, IR, 1R, big 1R, on SR. And then, you know, you, you look at the limit. Oh, there is some typo here. Uh, you'll take the limit of the, those metrics renormalized in such a way that it converges. So it, the limit when r goes to infinity of exponential minus 2r, 1r, right? Uh, there is a missing term in this, in this expression. Yeah? And in this way, you get two metrics. I mean, you can prove that those things converge. You know, basically, you know, in this uh, hyperbolic situation, the, the, the surfaces become bigger and bigger when you go to infinity, and, uh, and the coefficient that you need to have a you know, converging limit is exactly this exponential minus 2r. So you get, you get the limit. Uh, you get one minus star and one plus star, and those are compatible with c plus minus in the sense that the you know, complex factor on c plus minus you know, rotates the vectors 
for this, those metrics, right? So they are in the correct conformal class. And then you have to can prove, and what I'm going to say is slightly false, but not completely false, is that you know, if you know n, you know one star, but if you know one star, you know n too. So you can think of you know, this, this quantity w of n as a function of one star, yeah? And in this way, you forget about n, and you just look at this as a function on metrics in the conformal class at infinity. Yeah? And, yeah. Uh, seen in this way, it, is, it, it has interesting property. So the key property is that if you fix the area of one star, yeah, you look at all the metrics in the conformal class at infinity, a fixed area, then this W of one star is maximal exactly when, w, when one star has constant curvature. Yeah? So one W is a way to uniformize metrics in the boundary at infinity of M, in the conformal class at infinity. And then you can define W, the VR, so the renormalized volume, it's going to be exactly W of one star when one star is the hyperbolic metric in the conformal class at infinity. Yeah? So that's the definition. It's a s somehow indirect definition, but you know, it's reasonably you know, simple. Maximizing, you get a function which only depends on C plus and C minus. And therefore, you know, because of the you know, Bell's double uniformization theorem, it's a function from the space of quasi and manifold to R. Yeah? Uh, it has interesting properties. So one you know, key property is that it's the same as the Liouville functional that was defined by Zograph and Tartajan and, and studied by those people. It's not completely obvious to me why it is the same function. You know, the reason it is the same function is because they have the same variation formula. That's, you know, it leads to an obvious proof. But uh, otherwise, I don't really understand why it is the same function. But, you know, maybe as a consequence of this, or maybe you can prove it directly, uh, this function is actually, if you fix, you know, C minus and you vary C plus, right? So you change, you vary the quasi function manifold, keeping the same conformal factor at minus infinity and varying what happens at plus infinity, you, dec you get a killer potential for the weil pedersen metric on Tashman space. So it has interesting you know, analytic properties. Any questions on this? Okay, so um, now I, I want to, now what I want to do is, is you know, really make precise the analogy between the boundary of the convex core and the boundary at infinity. And for this, I need to understand better the data at infinity. You know, so far what we have, the data at infinity that we have is this you know, complex structure, but I want to have something which is the analog of the measured banding lamination at infinity. And I think there is a very natural candidate and I'm going to try to convince you that this is the right candidate. So what you can do is the following. So you know, you have this one R, which is you know, the induced metric on this surface at constant distance r from n. And you can write explicitly the induced metric on sr, 1r, in terms of r. You know, there is an asymptotic expansion, which in this case, because we are in hyperbolic geometry, is actually, actually exact. Right? So there are exactly three terms. So one is the one we already know, because you know, this is the definition of 1r, uh, 1 star, basically. And uh, then there is a constant term, and then there is a you know, exponentially decreasing term, and that's it. And this is the term we're going to be interested in. And actually, we're going to be interested in not only this term, but the, trace part, the traceless part of this term. And the reason is the following. So if one star is a hyperbolic metric, so you have to make this choice of a hyperbolic metric in the conformal class at infinity, then the traceless part of this second fundamental form at infinity, two star, is Kodazi, right? Kodazi means that if nabla is the levi civita connection of one star, then d nabla of two star zero is equal to zero. Yeah, maybe I can write what this means, right? This means so uh, this d nabla two star zero, if you, you know, it's something that can be evaluated on two vectors. It's a two form with values in, in uh, Oh, let's write it with Z. That's going to be simpler. So this is going to be nabla x two star zero of y z minus nabla y of two star zero of x z. And this happens to be equal to zero. So it's what we call a Kodazi tensor. And 
as a consequence, you know, because it's a traceless symmetric two tensor which is called as the, you know, it's known by, you know, very general arguments, old arguments, due to Hopf, I guess, that it is the real part of a holomorphic quadratic differential. Two. Yeah? So you get this data at infinity, and there is a way to understand this data at infinity in terms of the CP1 structure at infinity sigma, right? Uh, the, the way you do this is, maybe I shouldn't get into this, but you have a CP1 structure at infinity. You also have a complex structure which you can uniformize so there is a map you know, from the disk to the, you know, so this from the usual disk into this, which is you know, the Riemann uniformization map. And this is a map from a surface with a CP, CP, CP1 structure, the disk, to another surface with a CP1 structure, which is a sphere. And uh, well, you can take what is called the Schwarzschild derivative, oops, sorry, what is called the Schwarzschild derivative of this uniformization map, and you also get a you know, holomorphic quadratic differential, and it happens to be the same as this Q, right? So the data, I mean, the, the connection, there is a connection between the, you know, uh, representation point of view and the, you know, Riemannian metric point of view, which is that this second term is connected to this Schwarzian uniformization map. Now, uh, the key thing is that this Variation formula, there is a variation formula for the renormalized volume, which is very simple. So it sort of, you know, remind, it might remind you of the Schleffle formula, but at this point it's not going to be very close. The variation, the first order variation of the renormalized volume is going, is given by this, you know, scalar product between this second phenomenon form at infinity, I mean the traceless part, and the variation of the uh, hyperbolic metric at infinity, one star. Okay, well, we're going to get a closer interpretation, right? And to get this closer interpretation, I need to say a few things. Ah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I need to say a few things on measured foliations and on extremal lengths. Yeah, so far we, we've, to, we've been talking about, about measured laminations and high public lengths. And this was on the boundary of the convex core, but on, at infinity we'll have those different, slightly different notions, but related notions. So uh, what is a measured foliation on the surface? So it's a foliation which has singular points, it can have singular points, along with a transverse measure, right? And we're going to call this space of measured foliations MF, and there is a very close connection between MF and the space of measured laminations, which I'm not going to explain, but there is a one-to-one -one correspondence. And you can think of those two things as basically two ways of looking at the same object. Now, if you have a holomorphic quadratic differential Q, you know, define the horizontal measured foliations, which we can call H of Q. And again, I'm not going to give the you know, proper definition, but basically locally at, you know, at a non-singular point, at a generic point, you can write the holomorphic quadratic differential as DC squared. Yeah? And then the foliation will be by the you know, curve we know which are the, the, the curve, you know, imaginary part of Z is equal to constant. So the parallel to the, to the, to the X, X axis and the transverse measure is going to, to be given by how much you move in, this, in the direction of the Z axis, right? And those things, you know, they, they can be glued nicely to, to get this, uh, me this, uh, this measured foliation. Um, now, from this I want to define the measured foliation at infinity as a, the horizontal foliation of Q plus minus. Yeah, this Q plus minus, it's this you know, holomorphic quadratic differential at infinity, and it's you know, pretty reasonable to look at the measured foliation associated to it, and we get this data. Um, now, there is a notion of length defined for measured foliation, not in terms of hyperbolic metrics, but in terms of conformal structures. And the definition is well, we know it's the following. So you take any curve on a surface, but now our surface, it's going to be, it's going to be a, a Riemann surface. You know, there is no hyperbolic metric, just a Riemann surface uh, notion. And then the, what you do is, you know, you, you take a curve, and what you look at is the biggest annulus that you, you can embed in this surface so I'm going to make a really bad drawing. I have no idea how to draw this properly. But I'm going to try to you know, 
get a nice a big annulus to sit in, inside the surface in an embedded way. So I should do this on both sides, I guess. Um, so maybe you have no idea what I'm trying to draw, but I'm trying to draw a big annulus which is embedded in this, in this surface in such a way that the, that the, the, the core of the annulus is isotopic to the, to, the, to the curve, right? And when you do this, you know, you can look at the, at the, at the modulus of, of the annulus, and the, the definition is the following, basically, you, you know, realize your annulus as uh, something of, of, you know, by gluing the sides of a rectangle of H1, and then basically what you get in the other direction is the modulus, modulus of, of, the, of the annulus, right? Is that correct? Yeah, okay. So, uh, so basically, you know, this is a sort of notion of length, but that's defined purely in, co in a conformal way. Yeah? Uh, and again, like for the hyperbolic lengths, you know, Kirk have proved that the, uh, this extremal length extends to measured foliations, right? It's not only defined for closed curve, but from a closed curve, you can get a measured foliation, and you can approximate measured foliations by things like closed curves, and eventually, you have this extension. Okay. Uh, so I think we have everything in place to state uh, the analogy that I'd like to explain. So the analogy will be the following. So there is an analogy between the renormalized volume of the manifold seen from infinity, and from the boundary of the convex core, we're going to look at not the, not the volume of the convex core, but the dual volume of the convex core. It's a small difference, but it's going to make, make things a lot nicer. The induced metric on the boundary of the convex core is going to be analogous to the conformal metric at infinity, right? That's pretty natural. The measured uh, lamination, the measured banding lamination on the boundary of the convex core is going to correspond to the measured foliation at infinity. That's also reasonable, given what we said. And in t instead of talking of the hyperbolic length of the measured banding lamination with respect to the hyperbolic metric, we're going to think of the extremal length of the measured foliation at infinity in terms of the conform metric on the on, at infinity. Yeah? I think I'm repeating, repeating this. So now I'm claiming that this is a you know, pretty good analogy in the sense that first, are, you know, the same phenomena tend to occur in both situations, and also that the corresponding quantities are closed. And they're closed in a, okay, the point is that there are some things that I know and some things that I don't know. So the point is that there are quite a few interesting questions in this area. So one thing that works well is the following you know, formula, which is a consequence of the variation formula that we gave earlier. Um, so you know, we had this variation formula for the um, renormalized volume. So this was exactly the formula here. It was expressed in this you know, slightly complicated way. But using what is called the Gardiner formula, some kind of Gardiner formula, you can reformulate it in the following way. The you know, first order variation of the renormalized volume in a deformation of a quasi fraction manifold is exactly one half the differential of the extremal length of the foliation at infinity evaluated on the variation of the conformal metric at infinity. Yeah? And if you, if you remember what we said before, this is exactly the same formula, unless I made a mistake in the coefficient. It's exactly the same as the dual bonaon schleffli formula, right? The, the dual bonaon schleffli formula was here. And it's exactly the same formula given the analogy that we have developed. Um, yeah. So, um, so again, there are two things. Again, one thing is that uh, one statement is that the, 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 you know, the things that, in, that are at infinity are close to things on the boundary of the convex core, and another thing is that they behave in the same way. So, what do we mean by, by the fact that they're close? So, there are things that are well known. One thing is that. You know, first, I should say, because it's going to simplify what I'm going to say later, that the volume and the dual volume, they're almost the same, up to a uh, you know, fixed constant that only depends on the genus. And this is a result of Bridgman and Canary. So what they proved is that the length, you know, if you take any quasi fraction manifold, the length of the measured banding lamination for the hyperbolic metric on the boundary of the convex core is bounded by some universal constant depending only on the genus. And as a consequence, because of the definition of the dual volume, the dual volume is more or less the same as the volume of the convex core up to this constant. Um, uh, yeah, so then now, 
we can compare the renormalized volume to the volume of the convex core or the dual volume. This is the same because of this statement. And what we have is that those things are the same up to explicit constant that depend only on the genus. Yeah? So that's one reason why VR and VC are close. And another reason is that you know that M and C, they also close. And this is, you know, a uh, you know, result due to, I guess, well, the first, you know, estimate, I mean, this was a conjecture of Sullivan. There was an estimate due to Epstein and Marden, which was refined by many people since then, that say that the, bound, the induced metric on the boundary of the convex core and the conformal metric at infinity, they are uniformly quasi-conformal. Right, so the data at infinity and the data on the boundary of the convex core in terms of the metrics, they are not very far. But again, you know, the volumes, they are not also not very far up to some constant. Yeah, and uh, okay. So I should say that basically this is true for quasi function manifolds, but you know, Bridgman and Canary have proved that this is also true in some sense for more general, you know, convex or compact hyperbolic manifolds. Yeah? Okay, so now this leads to a number of, you know, of questions and uh, statements. So there are some you know, easy results. You know, the, um, so basically what I said before is that the length of the measured lamination, so Bridgman and Canary proved that the length of the measured lamination, of the measured bending lamination is, 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 is bounded from above by your uniform constant. And what is easy to prove is that the same happens at infinity. So the, the, the extremal length of the measured foliation at infinity with respect to the conform, conformal structure at infinity is bounded by a uniform constant depending only on the genus of the surface. Another statement that is you know, clearly true, uh, you know, if you know M plus and L plus, you, get, you, uniquely, you can uniquely reconstruct the quasi flexion manifold. And this is the same in this situation from infinity. So if you know C plus and F plus, you can uniquely reconstruct the quasi flexion manifold. This is completely, I mean, pretty easy, basically. I mean, consequence of you know, things that have been proved before. And, uh, but then there are questions. So I mean, one you know, basic question is, you know, we said that L plus and L minus feel, you know, they intersect any closed curve in a non-trivial way. And for F minus and F plus, that's something that should be true, but I don't know how to prove this. Um, another question that is, I think, interesting is, you know, again, you know, there is this conjecture of Thurston that L plus and L minus uniquely determine the manifold. And this is open, completely open for F minus and F plus. What's funny, if you think of it, is that the, you know, Thurston conjecture on M plus and N minus, you know, if you look at it from infinity, it's the fact that C plus and C minus uniquely determine the manifold. And this is completely true and well known in the, in the, um, in the terms of, of data at infinity, right? But for F plus and F minus, this is completely open. And it's not even clear what are the possible F minus and F plus. You know, given that for L minus and L plus, there are natural conditions that are you know, necessary and sufficient. But the uh, analog of those conditions for F minus and F plus, they are not completely obvious. Any questions on this? Thanks. OK. OK, so I'm going to you know, move on to some applications of renormalized volume and also connections to other you know, areas. Um, I'd like to talk a bit on, the, on bounds on the renormalized volume and the way you can use those things to, to obtain bounds on the volume of the convex core. So uh, there is a theorem of you know, Brock proved in the, uh, 2003 that the volume of the convex core is basically given by the weil pedersen distance between the, 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 the conformal structure at infinity seen as point in the Ashmore space. Yeah? Uh, now, the, the, this is true in the, in the, in the quasi-azometry sense, right? up to multiply, multiplying by some constant and adding some constant. Now, um, in terms of the renormalized volume, there is a much better estimate which is that the, you know, volume, the, re the renormalized volume is bounded by some you know, very explicit constants times the weil pedersen distance between C minus and C. And so where do we get this from? You know, there is this variation formula that I gave you that tells you that the, the, the sort of gradient, I mean, the differential of the renormalized volume is given by this 
this, uh, the real part of this holomorphic quadratic differential at infinity. And then it also comes from this uh, Nehari estimate that tells you that you know, Q, we said that Q is the uh, uh, Schwarzschild derivative of the uniformization map from the disk to the upper, upper you know, component boundary, upper component of the complement of the Jordan curve at infinity. So in particular, Q is the Schwarzschild derivative of a uni univalent map. And there is a, an old result called the Nehari estimate that in this situation, it has to be bounded by some explicit constant, which is free half. So if you put this together with this variation formula, you immediately get that this renormalized volume is bounded by this quantity. Yeah, it's a very simple argument. And now we said before that the renormalized volume is more or less the same as the volume of the, con of the, of the convex core up to some constant. And as a consequence, you get that the volume of the convex core is bounded exactly in the same way by the Weyl-Fassassen distance between the, the data at infinity. And this has been extended in, in uh, different ways by Kojima and McShane and also Macmillan. And, uh, I'm not going to explain this. But uh, this leads to applications. And I think maybe Jeff talked about some applications earlier in the first week of the, of the, of the, of the school. But basically, there are important applications uh, to the volume and entropy of mapping tori by Brock and Bromberg, and also by Kojima and McShane. And Brock and Bromberg, they also gave applications to the systems of the weit Pedersen metric on modular space. And uh, I'd like to point out that there are other, other types of applications. And typically, the sort of applications that you can have is that VR you know, can be seen as a generating function. Um, on Teichmann space, the space of weighted function manifold. And for instance, the sort of thing you can recover in a very simple way using this is what is called Macmillan's quasi friction reciprocity. And uh, so that's a, you know interesting statement that you can see it in the following way. So you, know, you, you look at the space of data at infinity obtained from quasi friction manifolds. Yeah, basically we said that for every quasi friction manifold, we have this you know, complex structure at infinity, C, and we have this holomorphic quadratic differential at infinity. But we know that you know, C can be seen as a point in the Teichmann space of the boundary at infinity, of the, of the boundary of the manifold. And this Q is a cotangent vector to the Teichmann space of the boundary. Right? So what you get is a set of points in the cotangent bundle of the Teichmann space of the boundary. Now, uh, this, the dimension of this space, the dimension of this space is, you know, so this has dimension, you know, you have 6G minus 6 for the upper boundary, 6G minus 6 for the lower boundary. So the dimension of, I should write it here maybe, the dimension of the Teichmann space of the boundary is 12G minus 12, where G is the genus of S, and therefore the, the, the dimension of the cotangent space is 24G minus 24. And the uh, you know, dimension of B is 12G minus 12. So this is equal to the dimension of B. So this is exactly the right situation you know, where we can hope that this is going to be a Lagrangian manifold of the cotangent space of you know, the Teichmann space of the boundary for the you know, cotangent simplex structure. And this happens to be true. So this is what Macmillan proved by different methods. But the proof is very simple if you use this, this tool. And the reason is that you have this you know, variation formula. So you know, the variation formula tells you that the variation of the renormalized volume is given by you know, the, the, the scalar product, I mean the, the, the bracket with this cotangent vector. Yeah? In other terms, you know, the differential of the volume is given exactly by the Uville form of, of the cotangent space. In other terms, you know, this tells you that on this, on this B, uh, the Liouville form is the differential of the volume, but this means that the symplectic form, which is, uh, which is the differential of the Liouville form, is zero on, on B, right? So you can obtain this result as a you know, one-line one line proof using the variation formula for the renormalized volume. Yeah. So that's the first type of you know, application. I mean, already several applications, but uh, first type. Um, ah. 
Yeah. You have other you know, applications that I think are worth mentioning. So uh, I'm sorry, I have to give a few more, a few more definitions, right? So uh, I have to define you know, the space CP of CP1 structures on S. So we mentioned this at the beginning. This is the space of you know, geometric structures locally modeled on CP1 with changes of charts in, you know, which are Möbius transformations in PSL2C. And uh, okay, and uh, so we have this, this space CP. And there is a you know, map which was defined by Thurston which gives a parameterization of CP by the product of Tashman space of S by the space of measured laminations. And uh, so how do you define it? Basically, I'm not going to define it, but it is defined in such a way that if you do the grafting, this, graft, this map is called grafting, the grafting of the you know, induced metric on the boundary of the convex core by this measured bending lamination, you'd exa you get exactly this CP1 structure at infinity. Yeah. You could, you know, there is a unique definition that satisfies this property, and it more or less tells you how this works. And, uh, okay, Thurston proved that this map is a homeomorphism. Yeah, so that's a nice way to, you know, describe the space of CP1 structures in terms of things that you might or might not understand better. And, uh, you know, a consequence of this renormalized volume uh, thing is that this grafting map, it's symplectic up to some factor, which is maybe two or one half. Uh, so it's not clear at all what this means if you think of it, you know, because, well, you know, the space of measured laminations, it's not a C1 space. You know, it's a, it's a you know, piecewise linear space, but not C1. So if you actually want to understand this map as a, CP, as, as, a, as, a, as a C1 map, you have to remember that this space can be identified to the cotangent space of Tashman space. So whenever you have a point in Tashman space, that's a hyperbolic metric, and a measured lamination, you can associate to this, this point in Tashman space with a cotangent vector. And in this way, you get a map from the cotangent space of Tashman space into the space of CP1 structures. And this map is C1. You know, although, again, it's not clear what this the C1, I mean, this, this map here cannot be C1 because it doesn't even make sense, but this map happens to be C1, and it is implectic up to a constant factor. And the way to prove this, again, is by using the properties, the variational properties of the renormalized, renormalized volumes of not exactly quasi friction manifolds, but things that are made from quasi friction manifolds. I guess I don't have time to say more. Any questions on this? But that's another type of... Yeah. Oh, yeah, what is the symplectic? Yeah, that's a good point. So um, uh, I think what you, what you should take here is the... So, I mean, there are, there are different ways to look at it, but in this case, you should take the... You should take the, the real... Uh, I have a doubt. I think you have to take the real part of the Goldman symplectic structure. I mean, both, both Goldman symplectic structure. But now, is it the real part or the imaginary part? Huh. <laughs> I think it's the real part. I better check and tell you after that. I need to think of the proof to remember which one it is. But yeah. Yeah. OK. Uh, so a third type of you know, application is, uh, again, a sort of symplectic application. And, you know, among those quasi friction manifolds, there are really nicer ones. And the nicer ones, they are called almost friction. So the friction situation is when we have a totally geodetic surface in the manifold. And almost friction means that it's not that, but it's not that far, in the sense that there is a closed minimal surface in the manifold with principal curvatures uniformly, I mean, strictly less than one. Yeah? So this happens in some situations, and it doesn't happen in other situations. But there is a theorem of uh, Unenbeck from many years ago that if M in, is almost function, so if there is a minimal surface with this property, then there is no other closed minimal surface. No. So then there is, this minimal surface is unique among all, minimal, all closed minimal surfaces. And uh, in this case, you can take the you know, traceless part of the second phenomenon form of S. And you know, it's again, because basically because we're dealing with a minimal surface, it's a codazzi tensor for the induced metric, and therefore it's a real part of a holomorphic quadratic differential for the you know, complex structure underlying the induced metric on the minimal surface. So you know, we have this map from quasi-function manifolds 
again to the cotangent space of Tachyman space, which sends a quasi fraction manifold to the conformal structure of the induced metric on the minimal surface and the traceless part of the second final form. And uh, there is another statement uh, proved by uh, Brice Lousteau in his thesis a few years ago that this map mean from the space of almost friction manifolds to the cotangent space of Tachyman space is again symplectic, you know, up to a constant factor. And uh, again, I should think of which symplectic structure you take on this space of but almost friction structure, but I think it is, must be the imaginary part of the Bart Goldman form. Yeah, and uh, hmm, that's it. So thank you for your attention.